87% of realtors get into the business and get out of the business in two years. That doesn't exist in our world. We have massive visions around growing our businesses, and we are always looking to add talent to our world. We do everything in our power to ensure the people we surround ourselves with defy the odds, get into production, and build massive lives for themselves. If you are a realtor looking to get into the business, we have a blueprint for success. With locations all across Canada, reach out to us. Let's talk about partnership and opportunities. We are looking forward to it. Guys, welcome to another episode of the Sales Beast Podcast. We are super excited and grateful to have Sahil Jaggi with us today. He's someone, we went to the same university, and uh, I was just joking around that he has no idea who I am, but he's someone I've been following for a long time. Sahil has done $150 million in sales. 250 actually. I won't take that. 250 We have a whole stack. 2021, yeah. Okay, nice. 250 in volume in Toronto. That's right. 15 houses owned correct that gone up since uh since no no <laughs> no we gotta change that that was recent yes yeah okay and a whopping 20 million dollar real estate portfolio he's not that old you're only 36 years old right that's right yeah nice so impressive guy and we can't wait to ask you some questions and learn more about how you've been able to accomplish all this sure yeah no pleasure to be here thanks for having me guys and yeah it's been a very interesting, long journey. I finished, uh, I guess, as an investor, a decade in real estate this year. Started in 2010 when I was my, bought my first investment. And I got my real estate license in 2014. So I uh, finished my, uh, I guess, my seventh year in 2021 and uh, my 10th year as a real estate investor. So long, That's awesome. very interesting journey, lots of ups and downs. And I'd love to share the gist of it with you guys today. Can we, uh, can we rewind it back a little bit further? So. Like I mentioned earlier, we went to the same university and from what I've read up on you, you were very successful at what you were doing prior to getting into real estate. Can you maybe share with people what you were doing? Before? Yeah. So just so you know, like at Laurier, uh, if you want to rewind back to like I, I came to Canada in 2003 and I did my grade 12 again. And then uh, 2004 is when I got into Laurier. So I came here as a student with the intention of like, I guess, my pursuing my higher education in, in Canada from, uh, from back home and went straight to Laurier after one year in high school and uh, got into the economics and finance program. So, you know, early 2000s, like the, the, the whole thing was to get into finance, you know, finance was the it industry to be in back in the day. And now it's like more about tech and startups back in the day it was all finance, Wall Street, Bay Street. So I come from the uh, mindset where it was always my dream to be uh, like in investment banking and all that. Uh, three or four years in Laurier, I was a very B grade student. Actually, I, I wasn't like a book nerd at all. I was just, you know, first year, second year. Was, Laurier was a blast. So it was like, you know, it was just a great place to be. Uh, had tons of fun. I did get my degree in finance and economics, but I did like I, I scored an amazing opportunity to work with CIBC World Markets actually uh, in New York on Wall Street. So straight out of school, I got like a dream job, but not because of my grades, but because of the I, I give a lot of credit to the networking. I reached out to all the right people. And the way I got that job was actually pretty interesting, too, because I got an interview with CIBC World Markets in Toronto and then I didn't get the job. And I reached out to the interviewers and I told them, I said, I'm open to like traveling anywhere at all, as long as it's with CIBC and as long as it's, it's invest in banking. And then he recommended that I fly out to New York. And there is a position there. And luckily, I got the job. So a blast of a one and a half years in New York working on Wall Street. But in a year and a half, even though I was good at it and it was a great job and everybody thought I was insane to even think about. But I just like hit a hit a wall where I was like, I don't want to do this anymore. I didn't I didn't resonate with the corporate industry that much. I did not resonate with finance at all. So the goal was to just come back to Toronto. Uh, I miss where my friends are. My, I, I guess I like Toronto as a city better. And I did not like want to continue with finance anymore. So contrary to a lot of people were like, you're absolutely insane. You have such a great like start and you can continue working in Wall Street and doing better. But I came right back in 2010 without a plan. And only thing I knew that I wanted to be in sales, a little bit more direct sales. And I didn't want to go into a nine to five and I didn't even want to go into an office. So I took up a job with Nestle in corporate sales. And that's when I you know, started looking for real estate for myself to live in. And that's how I accidentally like fall, f fell into the whole, like, you know, starting the research about real estate and getting into the actual investment side. So you started out as an investor, not as a realtor. Yeah, absolutely. I was working in Nestle corporate sales, trying to figure out my next moves. 
And I was like, okay, you know what? I'm going to buy a property for myself to live in instead of renting. And that's where the initial research started where I was like, you know, I like to get into things a, a little bit more before I was like, you know what? I'm going to put my entire life savings into a property. I need to like kind of make sure what I'm buying is the right thing to do. And the plan was to purchase a two bedroom condo at the time. And condos were about 380, 400 in the Young and Shepherd area in North York. And all of a sudden I started looking at these bungalows on big lots at four to 500. So that's when I, you know, big light bulb went on. I'm like, look, there's, that's a huge discrepancy between freehold properties and properties that come with an upside. You buy something small on a big piece of lot in an amazing location. And these are old houses, second world war homes. You see that opportunity. And I'm like, why would I purchase a, a fancy condo, pay a maintenance fee when I can just live in this property, live in the basement and rent out the main floor. And this is before I even understood the term house hacking. It just made sense financially to do it. So I did that. I bought a, per, a house uh, right at uh, Young and Shepherd, a 50 foot lot by 150 foot. So huge land. Uh, I moved into the basement, rented out my main floor, and that's how my investment journey started. And then what happened from there? So you obviously house hacked, you had a tenant living upstairs. They were paying the majority- pretty much like 80% of my mortgage and my expenses. I was the landlord living in the basement downstairs. And then yeah, from that point onwards, uh, I saw that opportunity that, you know, Toronto as a city really intrigued me. So from a macroeconomic perspective, I felt Toronto compared to a lot of other big cities in the world were very undervalued. If you look at Toronto, like compared to like big cities like New York, Singapore, London, it just it, like, you know, it's a very immigration friendly country. Uh, education is really good. Healthcare sector is fantastic from an infrastructure perspective. And a lot of people who live in Toronto and don't travel as much or I, me coming from a place like, let's say in, in India and my sister lives in Singapore and I've seen quite a few cities in the world. I'm well-traveled. So for me, uh, you know, to see Toronto, I always felt like it had way more opportunity. It had way more scope. And for the, for what real estate at that time was in 2010, it was just too, it's very undervalued to me, but it's not just about it, it, it just not just an, uh, enough to say Toronto is really good, but where in Toronto do you buy? What in Toronto do you buy? So I started looking into it and the best asset class that came to me was uh, purchasing freehold properties within that freehold category, eliminate, you know, things like semi-detached townhomes and go straight for detached and within the detached category buy a bungalow. Why? Because it comes with the biggest upside. If you buy a small property on a big piece of lot, even from a zoning standpoint, it's not reached its highest and best use. It's far from it. So that concept really intrigued me. And the fact that the cash flows worked out really well, you put 20% down, interest rates are really favorable. Mortgage was a lot easier to get back in 2010, even with my Nestle corporate sales. So I bought 2010, I bought my first, 2011, I bought my second, 2012, I bought my third. And that's when I started realizing that the financing was sort of I was reaching a, a saturation point from a financing perspective. And that's when I started like, I can't stop here. The idea is great. And so I started reaching out to joint venture partners. The, the challenging part that I f- feel was that I didn't have that much family backup or friends backup here. Like, yes, I made amazing friends from Laurie. I'm still friends with them. But from a business standpoint, I really had to go out there and hustle and sell that same idea to a lot of people to be able to joint venture with them. So while I was still holding my job at Nestle to sort of help me with financing, pay for my day-to-day expenses. I really had that passion to double down on real estate there because I still saw a ton of opportunity, not just in central North York, but in different parts of Toronto as it was growing. Fast forward, I guess, 10 years. uh, Today, I have uh, 17 properties out of which, and I've sold four or five after developing them. So all the 25 properties that are purchased, they've been very similar. I'm still following the fundamentals of my investment strategy is still very similar which is buy undervalued properties, undervalued asset that come with a lot of upside. That's awesome. I think that uh, like obviously when you're first starting out, you need to buy some in your own name on your own in order to build credibility. That's something I did. I yes. Similar situation in the sense that when I moved to Ontario, I didn't know a soul. A lot of people in this province that trusted me. It sounds like you were in a similar place. What was the biggest challenge you had to overcome when you moved from purchasing purchasing these places yourself to sourcing capital from others? The biggest thing is credibility. And I think that comes with, uh, with time. It comes with experience. It's not easy to go to somebody and say, you know what, I have a great investment opportunity. Why don't you invest with me? It's not. Uh, and even though real estate, to, it resonates with a lot of people, but if they don't know you at a personal level, it's a very different from somebody to go to like his uncle or somebody to just say, 
hey, invest with me, right? So I did reach out to a lot of like distant people and all that. I started with some close family, like uh, not my immediate family, like some distant families and all those people like, hey, I'm doing real estate. I have a few things. I'd love to sit down with you, coffee with you and blah, blah, blah. And you go from one, like, you know, one meeting, 10 meetings, 20 meetings, 30 meetings. The biggest challenge you, you, you get is that, hey, like you're still a young kid. I don't really trust you. Yes, you left banking, you went to Laurier, but at the same time, you kind of like, did you get fired? Did you just leave New York? What are you doing now? So to get that credibility was probably the biggest challenge. Like today I walk into a room, it's very different, right? People see the track record, people see the proven results. The pitch is very different. And you've got a bunch of people who love to joint venture with you in a snap of a finger. But as a newcomer, it's very challenging. So the advice that I would do is what I started learning from my mistakes was, that you have to be thorough, you have to have a fantastic plan, and you need to know how to sell things, right? As a businessman, as an entrepreneur, whether you're in real estate, startup, tech, like anything that you do, it's very important to, you know, if you're not a natural salesperson, to go and really brush up your sales skills. Because if you're going to scale, if you're going to grow, and if you're going to like do anything really, really well, you need to be able to take the really good idea and be able to sell it as well. It's not enough to just have a great idea and sit in a corner and cry that no one's investing in it. You need to be able to go out there and it's on you to be able to explain to people, earn their trust and eventually get to a point of credibility that, that you can sort of leverage up on. So my biggest challenge starting out that you have no credibility, no background, no proven results, and you're trying to sell somebody something and they're one of the first to buy. So it's human psychology. They're going to want to see proven records and you don't have that. So that challenge can be overcome by training. That challenge can be overcome by networking with the right people who are kind of sold on the idea but are looking for the right partner. And really, really work on your sales skills because that's going to be a biggest tool as you scale in business. So it sounds like you're kind of a student of the market and what happens, you know, not only throughout Toronto, but like you said, in the GTA and surrounding. So what were some of the things that you were doing early on in your career and that you continue to do today to help you make sure that, you know, whatever deals either yourself or your clients are getting into are the right investments for them? A lot of research, a lot of due diligence. And I think one of the things that has really helped me is that when you go to joint venture with people, you have to make them understand how much skin you have in the game, right? And you can take that example. Like, for example, I know tons of people who are just, I'm a pre-construction specialist and I have all these access to properties and I have platinum access. But imagine a person who's selling to you saying that I have purchased two or three projects in this, in this pre-construction myself. And here's the reason why I invested in it. And now why I want you to invest in it. So whether or not it's sales, you have to be a buyer of your own product. And I have always strongly believed myself as being an investor first. And that's why it helped me really be super successful in my sales career as a real estate agent. So in the beginning, when I was investing, I've always used until date, I use that sales pitch that I don't ever sell anything to anybody that I don't buy, believe in buying myself, which is why currently I still haven't sold a lot in pre-construction because I don't truly believe in buying pre-construction myself. I don't think it's the smartest way to invest into real estate. So I say it very publicly, like, I think it's a little bit crazy that, you know, there's all these lineups and people are overpaying for projects and people are okay paying $1,500 a square feet somewhere downtown without even knowing what the closing costs are, but they have trouble investing in a very undervalued bungalow in an area, which is booming with growth. But all this is because people are following the fad. So as a salesperson, if you identify the right thing, become a buyer of it, go through the experience of purchasing it, you'll be able to transfer that empathy over to a lot of people on the other side, make them believe in the same idea and, you know, crush the sale by saying that I've invested my, like, you know, a lot of the times when I'm selling to people, they see my passion and they're like, if it's so good, why don't you go invest in it yourself? And I say, I have 80% of my portfolio contains what I'm trying to sell you right now. And that's usually the the, the, the time when they'll feel very secure purchasing with you because you're not just an average salesperson just selling to make commission, but you're selling something that you truly believe in, are successful at, and promoting at the same time that you're buying. So to a lot of salespeople, to a lot of realtors, try to get into real estate yourself, identify the, the, the properties that you feel you're passionate about, create the right logic, and then be able to transfer that sale to someone else. And it will make your sales career a lot better, credible, and you'll have the same people come back to you for results. You make such a good point because a lot of realtors in this industry or just people in real estate overall don't necessarily take on the investor side of the business or even buy their own properties. And, and mm -hmm. it's sad to see. So I think 
it's important to educate. The word expert is really wrongly used in real estate. Like, you know, getting your license doesn't make you an expert. Getting a license gives you the right to sell and buy real estate for other people. But to become an expert, you have to be a buyer of it and uh-huh. you have to show proven records of it. And that applies to anything. You're, you don't become a great lawyer by getting a law degree. You become a great lawyer by, by doing a lot of cases and having an expertise in that field. And then being able to like have a bunch of clients say, okay, you know what? I'm an expert at this specific thing. So it'd be nice to have more regulations that can, you know, and it's tough because, um, you know, it, it, like even when, when realtors come to me for coaching and they're like, you know, if we're starting out, how do we get people to believe in us and do all that? I said, narrow down your areas, farm an area, which is very, very strong. Don't go around telling people that I can like do anything anywhere. Like I, oh, I can sell in Scarborough. I can sell in Etobicoke. I can sell in Vaughan. Pick a very small pocket. Go door knocking in that pocket and learn that pocket, learn the streets, learn the schools, learn the parks, and then be able to tell, I'm an expert in this very small 500 meter area. And I know this area better than anybody else. And then you can create yourself to become an expert and then slowly scale. So Truly become an expert, truly become good at something, truly know how to sell that idea and then go and execute. And, you know, then typically you will earn that credibility to do better. I really Sorry, like- I'm going on a rant. So I'm hoping- No, no, I'm no. You're, you're crushing it. Don't worry. I really yeah. like what you said, though, is uh, the example of like being a lawyer, like in order to have an ex- like experience or be an expert lawyer, you have to have cases and precedents and, and essentially be able to go through the experience in the way that you can replicate it and scale it, like you said. Um, or, now, or those lawyers usually will team up with the right lawyer and say, I work with a firm that has a lot of experience and hence why a lot of new realtors should latch on to the right people to be their mentors for at least in the beginning of their career. Mm-hmm. So I'm have one or two agents now that are working under me and they're using my branding and leverage and my ability to oversight every single client that they're using. And that has the passion, the ability to give them the time and the expertise that has come with it with years of of that. So there's smart ways of executing this, but I think it's a very, uh, almost like a wrong to go around saying that I'm an expert at this with no experience whatsoever here. So that part, I think from a consumer perspective, if anybody is watching this, who's not a real estate agent is trying to identify a real estate agent, just be sure about like picking the right expert in the right field and the right like area of real estate. It will make or break your real estate career. Mm-hmm. You, when you got into the business, did you have any, any mentors that you relied on or did you figure it out on your own? I am the person who has learned through every single mistake in the book. I did not have a mentor. I didn't have the luxury of having a mentor. Looking back, I wish I did, but I truly, uh, Mike will tell you that there is not a single mistake that I have not made in real estate and I continue doing it. But the only difference is that I don't try not to make the same mistake twice. So when I tell a lot of people, don't make this mistake and we will not do this in the offer. We will not put this clause in the offer. Usually I have learned it the hard way and I, you can call it my good luck or bad luck, but I've always learned the hard way, but that has, then that goes into your brain because then, you know, when you're representing a lot of clients, a lot of investors, they see how passionately sometimes I will put a ceiling on a, on a, on a bidding war. And I'll say, we're not overpaying for this. This is the max we'll pay because I had an experience to relate it with. And I have the pain that I, that I can associate it with. So no, I don't have that many mentors. I have learned it the long way, uh, but you know, I've learned it through a lot of mistakes, but the, the smart thing is that you don't make the same mistake twice. And whoever is mentoring under you, you don't let them make the same mistakes for the sake of efficiency. Great point. You mentioned, um, refining your sales skills and what does that mean to you do you take on any kind of education or training or different things that you implement both for yourself and for your realtors to help you become a better salesperson or even just a business owner day to day yeah so i've always been an extrovert since day one i like you know even at laurier like i used to raise money for the alumni so i was like you know cold calling and doing all that then i worked at the mall in the entire my entire life in retail while i was putting myself through school and taking loans so for me Sales is like inbuilt, right? But at the same time, I should also not like not no, nobody should say like, hey, I'm an extrovert. I'm happy to sell. I enjoy selling. That doesn't make you an expert either. It's also there's some science to it. So yes, I have done coaching uh, through like guys like for example Tony Robbins. I've bought a lot of uh, courses from Tony Robbins. I think the guy still is the biggest best salesperson out there. Any kind of training that you need, business mastery or anything like that, 
I don't think I have ever gained knowledge from anybody, any other human being more than Tony Robbins. And I don't think you need to even go outside of the scope of the education list that he has in different topics. So I've learned a lot from him, not one-to-one, not face-to-face, not by attending his, but just reading up on a lot of his materials that are online and purchasing a few others like business mastery and sales skills and all that stuff. Other than that, I have tried and tested a few other coaches that I've not really resonated with. And I feel like a you have to find the right person that you also resonate with. So, but you know what, with nowadays with social media and guys like, you know, like podcasts and there's so much learning out there. You can literally just go on thing like Spotify and just, I sound like a dinosaur when I say we didn't have Spotify back in the day, but just seven, eight, nine years ago, you didn't have Spotify and we were, and I was trying to learn scale sales better and better. So I used to read books and I used to use this, but yeah, so a lot of sales training out there, anybody who's looking to learn basic concepts of sale. Like now I say, I, I teach sales, right? For example, now I'm teaching the same courses that I have developed. Like it's called the restart program. And it's a little bit of everything. It's a little bit of Tony Robbins. It's a little bit of real estate. It's a little bit of, you know, ideas from different places. And I've compiled it into this course called restart that I was teaching in Shoe Lake and now I'm teaching in uh, Ryerson. And I also do a lot of that mentorship, uh, which is just like, you know, free of cost. I got like students come into my office once a month and I teach that stuff. So there's a lot of information, a lot of right people. Find the person that you resonate with, create your own style, and then just practice. Get the reps in, get out there, put yourself in situations that are out of your comfort zone and every day you learn. What, uh, I was reading somewhere that you do go back and you teach at Chulik. What kind of response do you get from, from the students that are there? Amazing, man. A lot of people that are very fascinated. A lot of people are like, you know, hey, we want to do the same thing and we want to learn this and we want to learn that. And that's the time you remind them that it didn't just, I didn't just like fall into the stage and you have to see what's going on behind the stage more than anything else. I've gone through some ama- and crazy emotional days where, you know, you're just, frustrated and you're doing your first construction project with no construction experience you're doing your first you know sales pitch with no sales experience you're doing your investor pitch with no investor experience so i've gone through that learning turmoil but i try my best to like sort of ground these students and really give them the reality check on how much time how important it is to put the reps in and you and it's very important to sort of be patient and not just expect results to fall into your lap within a few months cuz Anybody who's just expecting the results to fall into their laps in any kind of entrepreneurship role is fooling themselves, right? So I think any sales teaching, anything that you're going into, people just need to sort of slow down their expectations a little bit and put in the right time. And eventually the results will come if your heart is into it and you really enjoy what you do, right? So those are the kind of things that I will teach in this restart. And just, just to polish up some skills, right? How important it is to have your mindset when you go into a sales pitch, how important it is to qualify a client before you take on a client, like just those basic fundamental concepts. I think of you, uh, you came and taught that when I was at Laurier in 2015. Yeah. What's that be working for you right now? Actually, I don't know if you know Graham, but I know a few people at Laurier because I was nominated for one of those awards and I was at some point getting involved just before COVID. And when we talked and I'm like, I'm teaching at Ryerson and Sure, like, why am I not like, you know, being a part of the school that I love and I, and I was, uh, I was going to, and then it just fell apart because of COVID. And then they're like, oh, you should do these online uh, videos and all that stuff. And I said, I'm an in-person kind of teacher. If I'm going to teach some students, it's got to be face to face. I can't record this stuff because it's just not fun for me. Right. And I'm not trying to like create a revenue out of my teaching business. So this is more of something that is just like giving back. So I'd, I'd rather do it in person and that's why it never worked out, but I should definitely reach out to them if the schools are reopened. I'm not even sure if they are. It's really amazing because yeah. a lot of the student, a lot of students that I went to school with at Laurier, they, they came from families that have similar background. Like my mother, for instance, she's got her MBA and my dad's a CPA. And I grew up with television thinking I need to go do an undergraduate degree, then go do a master's, then go get a job. And it's such a huge gap between what you are actually teaching, learn in school and versus what the real life business is. Right. And I feel like a lot of the restart stuff that I was teaching was to just to fill in that gap as much as possible and really understand and make people understand the importance of sales. Yeah. The impact you can have on, like, even if you impact one person, like for me, it was my realtor, Sandy opened my eyes to the business of real estate sales, to investing if I didn't meet him and if he didn't sell me that 
house many years ago, my life would look vastly different. I am a thousand times happier doing what I'm doing today than what I was doing prior to meeting him. So yeah. you just, you're changing people's lives and opening their eyes to a world that they probably don't even know exists. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, I want to do the Laurier thing with you. Have yeah, you? no, absolutely. I mean, like, yeah. I, I love this stuff. Like, it's just like anything mm-hmm. like mine and any kind of volunteer stuff that if I were ever to do, it would be to take on students that are just graduating and teach them the importance of sales and maybe even 10 classes to get them a little bit more prepared for the real world. That would be my specific expertise of volunteer. Yeah. Uh, even like financial well-being and financial knowledge, that's something that doesn't get taught in school, even when you're in university. And I think it's such an important piece that I'm sure you probably have that in mind to bring back to the community. Yeah, I mean, real estate today is one, is the top contributor to GDP of this country, and we're still not teaching it properly to anybody. How to buy a house, what to do. There's not enough knowledge out there, not enough investment knowledge out there. When there's an appetite and not enough knowledge, everybody ends up in the wrong hands. 100%. So tell us a little bit about your vision going forward. You've already amassed, you know, a huge empire and you're building your team, you mentioned. So what does the next couple of years, the next five years look like for you and for your business? Yeah, absolutely. So last few years, I've gotten a lot more involved in development side of real estate now. So I've completed my fourth or fifth luxury home uh, project. So a lot of the times when I'm buying these bungalows, I typically buy them with a five-year plan. So let's say whatever I purchased in 2016, I'm building today. And the plan is to buy them in areas which are really, really growing. So you buy this property, you rent this property, you wait. And in five years, when there's enough new homes and there's validity of the end and like the sale price, instead of taking that bungalow and selling it at a really good premium to the builders, I am now the builder as well. So I'm building these homes and I'm selling them. So I'm really enjoying the luxury home sales. And I'm only doing them in a, like, you know, I'm doing, they're very energy efficient homes. They're modern, they're contemporary, and they're not like your traditional looking homes. So I want to focus on like that modern, contemporary, energy efficient homes. So I finished our fourth, fifth project this year, which did really well. And obviously the market really helped and where we had that project really helped and construction really helped. So I really want to start involving myself on more of the development side, but there's also a lot to leave on the table. If I focus all of my attention in a development, then I also can't compromise my sales business, which is why now I'm starting to take one or two agents who are like sort of replicating what I was doing with a lot of investors. One of the biggest criteria of any person who's going to be joining my team is that he has to have three properties minimum. So they have to be investors themselves. So the person that I'm partnered with, uh, Ritesh, he's just completing his license and he's already purchased three properties in the last few years. He was actually a doctor before. He's a young guy, very energetic, so perfect fit. And I want to continue growing my sales side of the business, but more from a mentor side, instead of like going and showing properties, just to like train a lot of agents to like become really good agents and focus more of my attention on development. I want to continue growing my portfolio at a very healthy rate. How you determine health in a portfolio is directly related to its loan to value. So loan to value currently in my portfolio is 50%, which is very conservative, but I want to continue that maybe up to 60%, but continue growing. So maybe grow that portfolio from today, I'm at 23 million. So maybe up to like 30, 35 million, where I can also have very sustainable passive income eventually. So a lot of the properties that I'm buying are focused on equity appreciation, but I'm going to now start diversifying more into cash flowing properties so that I can have a nice channel, nice stream of passive income mixed into my portfolio and I keep developing as well. Thirdly, I'm also looking into land parceling now. So for example, and not out of Toronto at all, only in Toronto. So I'm looking at certain areas where you have a lot of these warehouses and like industrial zoned properties and you want to buy them and you want to try and like hold on to them till they're rezoned. So just, uh, you know, scaling up, doing different things in real estate, there's so much to learn. I feel like if I do too much of one thing, I kind of get bored of it. I want to know the next thing. I guess I'm blessed enough to really have amazing investors with me now that are like sort of part become really good partners and they're high net worth individuals. So I don't have anything stopping me to go in purchasing bigger projects. And like, let's say you buy four or five homes and you turn that into like townhomes and something like that. So I definitely see myself taking a bigger role in development mentoring more in sales and growing as an investor more conservatively. That's awesome. I've heard that you're into that buying these bungalows holding for five years or so, tearing them down and then building a palace. What's involved in in building a luxury home like that? And how did you go from Um, 
experience with it to actually breaking ground? So the first project that I started was in 2015. Again, with zero experience, I just decided, you know what? Even if I screw up this project, I'll still walk away with break even because the land cost has increased. So I literally put myself in that position to do it and took that risk with an expectation that even if I break even, I have a knowledge of how to build a home. That's all I really want to learn, right? And that's a great skill to have at a later stage. And that's the precedence I went into this project with. And I did learn a lot. This particular project, the first project I did, I bought this property for 700 in 2012. I started building in 2015. I put in another 800K and I was hoping to sell it for 1.6 to 1.7, but there were so many construction delays. Like I had so many issues with contractors. I had no idea what I was doing. So at some stage, the drywall was already laid and we realized the plumbing was wrong. So we are ripping all that out, redoing it. But eventually the delay really helped me because the market was on fire. So each month of delay added an extra 100K to my sale price. And I ended up selling that house for 2.6 million, clearing a million on it. So, so it kind of worked out. And that gave me the power to go and buy three or four more and then repeat the model better with no mistakes. So now that I really understand the, the luxury aspect, the biggest thing I would say is when you buy a home, your acquisition stage, you should really envision what I can possibly build on it in three, four to five years. And it has to have that check mark that if and when I'm ready to build this home, it can have a 3,000 square feet home, two car garage, all the stuff that you need, which is in keeping with the neighborhood to be able to sell it at a really good sale price. So plan for that in your acquisition stage. Understanding of zoning, building permits, what's allowed, what's not allowed is very important. Keeping up with the trends, what kind of designs, energy efficiency, laneway homes, garden suites, what kind of trends we are going towards. How is the city shaping up? We have all this pressure on the provincial government to increase the supply, which is probably the only way we're going to tackle affordable housing. So just know, when you know these things unconsciously, it starts going, all of it goes into a ball. And that knowledge just goes into your, this is the property that fits all the criteria and let's buy it. So I think I'm starting to get really good at like looking at a property from a lot of different lens. And then again, very complimentary to my sales business, because then I can take that knowledge and also give it to investors who are like, you know what, you really know what you're doing because every time you buy a property, it beats the market by double digits. So if the market's doing really well and you're doing, you're beating the market, you're probably the guy to, you know, help us buy as well. So it kind of just complements. So I keep researching and trying to get better and better and stay ahead of the market and then take all my clients with me. So uh, I even forgot what, what we, what the question was, but you kind of get the gist of what I'm trying mm. to do. Right? So, so the, it's a lot of interesting stuff. <laughs> That initial build for anyone looking to build a house themselves, did you have the 800 grand in pocket or was Took a it lot of loans and uh, believe it or not. So in this project, I also had a, had a partner, I had a 25% partner who gave me 50% financing and I gave him 25% equity. So I structured the deal really well. And I also took a line of credit from the property that I had that I purchased in 2010. So I took, so by that time, the property had 900 K I refinanced it. And I still remember that, every commission check that I was closing was going into a payment to a contractor. So I was hand to mouth until 2016. I was barely like, you know, I working with like a working capital of $3,000 in my bank account, handling an $800,000 construction project and finding the means to like pay my rent because I was renting. And I was like, you know, my, my, my car that I was driving, what I was eating, it all had to be like day to day. I had to like, you know, wake up next morning. I had to close deals in order to be able to pay my contractors to fill in the gap of the loan. So it was fun times, right? It was very aggressive selling. I used to door knock like four hours straight and like bitter cold if I had to, but I was pumping deals because I was like, I have to close four deals this month. Otherwise I'm not going to be able to pay this contractor in two months when he comes to frame. So it was all, all in one shot. It was just one thing after the other, but it was fun. It was a lot of fun. I've been there. I was there a couple of years ago. I had, I think, three projects on the go, five grand in my account, maybe. Owed yeah. a contractor 50 in a couple of weeks and owed another contractor. Yeah. And that pressure is real, right? So when it's that, you real, think that's healthy? And you don't should... need much more. You don't need to go in the morning and listen to motivation talks. You're, you're just up in the morning. You're like, I got to go before I get like screwed. <laughs> yeah. Like, it's terrifying. Losing money is the biggest motivator. Remember that. Nobody yeah. can motivate you more than the, the thought of losing money. Mm. I mean, one of the best ways to lose money is to run out of money when you're doing the job. Yeah. I would, I would maybe, um, 
argue with you on that. I don't think money's the motivator. It's the emotion and what is going to happen if you do run out of money. Like you'll be lost with a home. The, it's the emotion of pain associated with exactly. losing of money. Just to mm-hmm. like, you know, the, people do a lot more when they know they're going to lose money than they know that the pleasure of when they're going to make money. I feel like the pain associated with that emotion is a little bit more stronger. We did a full episode uh, a couple of months ago on the pain of discipline versus the pain of disappointment and which one you would choose. And it's such a like crazy thought to think because most people t- tend to think disappointment, right? Versus discipline and don't go for the <laughs> disciplined route. But what can you do, right? Security industry is thriving because of that, right? Insurance industry is thriving because of that. Pharmacy or healthcare industry is thriving because of that. The precautionary measures that people are pay so much more just because they don't want to go through the emotion of pain. When you know that, you know, if you don't move your ass and close deals, otherwise you will lose money and that will cause delays in your construction project was therefore my motivating factor to go and close more deals. And like I said, it all worked hand in hand and obviously market really helped. So you have to be a little bit factor of luck is in there as well. Call it the red line. Try, uh, I try not to do it too often, but yeah. yeah, that was just like the growth crazy. Like now I'm obviously have a lot more on stake, right? So I have to be a lot as you grow more and you have more to protect, you get more and more conservative. So I, like my level of ability to take risk in 2013 is way different than now. Now I have a lot more to protect, which is why all my acquisitions, how I plan my projects are to cover every single window of risk. There is everything just becomes more and more bulletproof and you have the means to do it. But in mm-hmm. the beginning, everybody has to go through that phase of risk. Absolutely. Mo money, mo problems, right? Yeah, exactly. Awesome. Well, um, I'm going to start wrapping things up here, but before we let you go, there's a question that we ask all of our guests. So Sahil, it's been wonderful having you on, but who do you know that we should know that we should also have on this podcast? I, I want to say, I want to be biased and say my partner, uh, Ritesh, who's just sure. joined me as like, you know, is just about to get his license as well. I think the guy is absolutely amazing. And uh, honestly, like, he has a very similar vision and he comes, he's a PhD student. I'm sorry, he's a PhD doctor in biotechnology or something. And for him to like drop that, now it, getting three properties in the, in, the, in, the, in the matter of two years in a hot market and he did amazing for that. And he's helped me close three to four deals even with, before he even got his license. The guy is a superstar up and coming. So if you get him on a show early, I think like you'll have a lot to like relate when in five years, I know for a fact he'll do really well super sharp mind. You know, he brings in a really different perspective to my business. Like I'm more sales. I have a bit of like ADD. I can't focus on one thing at a time. He's more organized. And I feel like even though I'm a lot ahead of him, he's got a lot of skills that he can bring to the table and he'd be a very, very interesting person for you to pick his brain. So I want to say Ritesh Daya, my partner. Okay, we'll have to get him in. Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. Any final questions or thoughts or comments or concerns? We'd love to hear your final takeaways. Yeah, so I would say number one, always look for the expert, spend a lot of time in finding the expert. And once you have, give him the trust that he deserves. So that, you know, also like, you know, leave when you have identified the expert, and that's in any industry, learn to trust their judgment. Don't try to be a person who likes to do everything, hire assistants, hire teams, hire stagers, hire mortgage agents, you know, agents who are like, yeah, I have my mortgage license and I have my realtor license and I can do your insurance too. And I'm thinking of going into law. No, focus one thing, be really, really good at it and make sure that thing that you do focus on, you actually enjoy it and love it. It's so important because it will give you that internal motivation to be really, really better at it and eventually get the credibility and then it's smooth sailing. So that's one piece of advice. And then again, thank you so much for having me on the show. You guys take the time out to like give knowledge to people, get the right guests. It's not easy to just take an hour or two in your day. So kudos to you guys to like, you know, bringing the right people on the show and giving value to people.